Moving Thank on to item 6-1, the last item for discussion on the agenda, consideration of options and authorization to submit a response to the May 7, 2020 California Department of Public Health guidance to county governments regarding variants from the governor's stay-at-home order. Uh, and this is all about COVID-19. So to those of you watching who had questions or comments related to COVID-19, we are now on that agenda item where we will also talk about uh, what a reopening of the economy might look like. CEO Jody Hayes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Olson, members of the board. Um, we have uh, mostly myself and, and Dr. Ration Pine here this morning to uh, discuss this uh, very challenging topic. Um, however, I do want to recognize uh, there's been a lot of work by folks behind the scenes to put together the information uh, before you today. I want to appreciate Ryan Loop, our management consultant here, for he's going to drive our presentation, but also assisting with getting this together. And I also want to recognize uh, County Council Tom Bowes. He's just been a tremendous support through this entire process. There are a couple of moments in today's presentation where we may need Tom to weigh in also to try to um, articulate some of the challenges that we've been facing from a legal perspective uh, in working under this new state guidance. So we're going to go ahead and start, uh, as I like to start most of the time, um, by looking at the dashboard um, for our local community. And I do this so that we can try to remind uh, uh, our community where you get information. So if you go to standemergency.com and you follow the links on coronavirus, you'll see a tab that says view statistics. Um, we're very proud of the work that's been done on the dashboard. And uh, you can see the statistics in a number of different forums. This is the cases tab. We have tabs on uh, deaths, hospitalizations, uh, testing, and um, our new tab on neighborhoods. I think we may have previewed this uh, last week um, uh, that shows uh, cases by zip code as well along with uh, when you hover over each of the zip codes, you'll get information on um, population data and so forth. Um, so that's been a, a good addition to the dashboard and we've had um, a lot of positive uh, feedback. I will share with you that we continue to receive uh, feedback on what we can do to improve the dashboard. And so we're updating it about once per week or so. Um, so we have some updates and uh, I'll share with you one of the updates that we look forward to making here soon is that um, on our tab that, um, that uh, portrays information on deaths in Stanislaus County. Um, we're actually going to try to provide more information there related to race and ethnicity as well. That's been an important topic for our community. Um, so we'll try to get that up there as quickly as we can. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into the material. And we wanted to first start by just reviewing where we were at over this last week. Uh, there was a lot of activity this last week. Throughout this entire emergency response, we've had quite um, a, a bit to do every single week, but last week was particularly um, uh, forthcoming in the challenges and, and the, the new information that we were working under. So I just want to preview uh, what we did last week. Monday was a big day. That was the governor announcing plans to allow local control with public health officers and the county board of supervisors. We were very encouraged um, by what we heard from the governor on Monday. And um, I'm going to do something I normally don't do, but I want to share with you some of the, the words that I heard on Monday that set the stage for how we were going to finish last week. The governor shared with us that their planning was done on the basis of health directors and local communities guiding their efforts at the state. Um, the governor shared that he had great confidence in local health directors, great confidence in local officials to understand the conditions in our own unique communities. We heard the state public health officer say that regional variation has been a really, really important topic and that she had been on the phone and in contact every single day with local health authorities, really understanding local conditions and understanding regional conditions and getting guidance uh, from locals. I share that with you because um, although we may not have been involved in those discussions, um, our understanding is that, um, that the rules and guidance from the state of California um, would respect the needs of local communities. And that's an important issue here. Um, on Tuesday, the, we had a new public health order that was put out to support our phased reopening for Stanislaus County. So you saw the public health officer working with this team as well as county council to uh, release a new guidance for our community that opened up more opportunities for our economy in Stanislaus County. Um, as of, I think the effective date was as of Friday last week, so we announced that on Tuesday. We also announced that we would be looking forward to even more guidance at today's meeting, that we would be opening more aspects of, of the Stanislaus County economy today. Um, on Thursday, the governor provided a detailed framework for this variance process 
uh, at the local level. Uh, he also announced more industry guidelines are coming in uh, this coming Tuesday, meaning today. So on Thursday, that's when we actually received the detail, and then on Friday, we received the actual order from the state public health officer. And uh, those were the two moments in which we knew that, um, that Stanislaus County was not going to be given the opportunity to open up more portions of our economy in Stanislaus County per the state guidelines. That's what this presentation is about today. We're going to share with you how we've reached that conclusions and what actions the state have taken to remove control from the local uh, uh, public officials here in Stanislaus County. So on this next tab, oh, thank you. Uh, I want to show you the framework that the state has um, put forward for reopening. Uh, first is stage one, and stage one was the safety and preparedness framework. We've been in stage one since the onset of this emergency, and that's just trying to make things safe and protect essential workers and to maintain business just within essential services. Um, stage two, the governor has announced that we've entered stage two and that there would be a gradual reopening or a dimmer switch, as the governor uh, mentions it, um, regarding retail, and that would be curbside only, and that there would be manufacturing and logistics to support that uh, process. So in Stanislaus County and any, any community in the state of California, as of last Friday, we can do curbside retail. I will share with you that um, curbside retail has continued in many portions of the state and probably some portions of Stanislaus County. I've personally seen some businesses. There were provisions within the essential services codes and guidelines that said that businesses could continue to conduct business in order to exhaust existing inventories and so forth. So if you saw retail outlets that were doing some business curbside or in some other fashion, obviously not letting people in the store to shop, um, I believe they were working within the confines of the existing rules and that that was appropriate. Last Friday was more of a formal um, recognition from the governor that um, uh, retail could open um, a widespread as long as they were doing curbside pickup, very similar to our restaurant uh, guidelines. Um, in stage two, uh, the governor has proposed two different versions of stage two. Uh, the first is what's already open, and we'll go in a little more detail there. The second is uh, more relaxed retail restrictions, um, but also mentions adapting and reopening schools. There's been a lot of conversation on that. The governor mentioned schools opening as early as July. Our local uh, uh, boards of superintendent have been very clear. They have no intention of reopening schools in July in Stanislaus County, so we're not sure where that connection uh, came from. Uh, child care offices, limited hospitality, personal services. Um, so stage two appears to be um, a, a long process, that that's not going to happen overnight, and you're not going to see all of these things occur in short order. Uh, stage three are those higher risk workplaces. So these are things such as movie theaters. Uh, this is where the governor puts religious services. So this is where the governor has, has indicated church type services would be prioritized as a higher risk in stage three uh, and more of the personal and hospitality services as well. Um, there is no timeline for that. We're going to discuss that. And then stage four is the end of the stay at home order. So that means that we can go back to what we consider business as usual, although we'll never be business as usual again now that we've lived through this pandemic. Right on to the next page. So I want to show you where you actually can get the reopening uh, framework um, from, from the state. And this is important. If you could pause there, Ryan. So if you go to covid19.ca.gov, this is where the information is. This is where all Californians should be going to get information on what the state's um, uh, direction is as it relates to what can be open in Stanislaus County. So we're going to go through this, and you'll click on the Resilience Roadmap. And then after you've done that, you'll see the various stages that I've just uh, summarized for you. But you're going to have to scroll all the way to the bottom of this page, and you're going to keep going. You're going to keep going through all of these uh, documents. And when you get to the very bottom, this is where you will find what can be open in the state of California at this time. So it's important for anyone watching or for anyone reporting on these issues that if you want to know what is uh, legal and available to be open in, in, in any community in California, you need to go to this page. The only exceptions to that are communities that have been granted a variance, and we're going to talk about the variance process. So uh, when you click on stage two, you're going to see that these are the businesses that the governor's office has um, identified that can be open now. Those are the businesses that the governor's office has identified that can be open later in stage two. And then if you click on that uh, additional link, it'll give you the list of things that are not included in stage one or two. So it's very clear these things are not included right now. 
So we'll go back to the presentation. I did think it was important for everybody to know where to look for this information. And while Ryan's doing that, I'll state that there was information on that website that came out on Thursday that when we clicked on it, that was new information to Stanislaus County. These are things that we've been operating under the, um, the guidance that we had some local control on some of these issues. And then the state included businesses and guidelines on that page that were not informed at local communities. We were not aware of those. And therefore, for the very first time, we um, were informed that some of our own public health orders uh, may be um, at odds with the state public health order. So here is the summary of what we just looked at. Um, stage two uh, now, these are the areas that can open with modifications. So like I said, curbside retail, our supply chain that supports that as well. Um, so we're happy to have that and hopefully those businesses in Stanislaus County that can quickly adapt to curbside are doing so. And I'll remind the businesses that if you need any assistance in doing that whatsoever, please reach out to us. We have an excellent business support team um, through our emergency operations center. Please call 211. Um, we have a team of individuals waiting to support businesses at least Monday through Friday during regular business hours. And we will help you adapt your business so that you can do this curbside retail if you're having difficulty with it. Um, stage two, uh, this, these is, this is a later stage, and this, or it requires a local variance. So this is what we're talking about at the current moment. The state of California has said that all of these businesses, and you can read them there, shopping malls, swap meets, car washes, pet grooming, tanning facilities, landscape gardening, um, office-based businesses, dine-in restaurants, um, uh, those are the items that the governor says cannot be open in, in, in the state of California unless you have a local variance. Um, and we're gonna talk about what that process is for a local variance. Um, and once again, I wanna mention that some of those items were brand new to us when this guideline was released on Thursday. And then future stages. Uh, there is no timeline from the governor on when these future stages would occur, but this includes things like barber shops, uh, tattoo parlors, gyms, hospitality services, bars, lounges, and those entertainment things. But the things I wanna point out here on this list that I think are, are important for us to be tracking is you can see things like libraries, and you can see um, playgrounds, picnic areas. Um, those types of things in the governor's order um, have no timeline whatsoever for when they may be restored um, uh, in service to our community. And those are important to us because those are things that we offer uh, as a community um, to our, our public. So I wanna next talk about the variance process. What does it take to get a variance in the state of California under these guidelines? There are six different criteria. The stability of COVID-19, which is really about your cases. What do your cases look like in your community? Um, protection of essential workers, testing capacity, containment capacity, hospi uh, hospital capacity, and protection of vulnerable populations. I will share with you, we agree with these types of categories. Yeah, there certainly should be a stability of the disease prevalence in the community before you move forward. Um, we certainly should be protecting employees. We should have testing capacity. We definitely need hospital capacity, and we have that in Stanislaus County. We've reported that routinely. Um, we're actually very proud of the fact that we move forward with um, plans uh, to, to have an alternate care site location very early in this process, and our hospitals are well equipped. Um, and protection of our vulnerable populations. We're also proud of the fact that we had one of the first alternate care, or I'm sorry, one of the first uh, shelter plans in our region. Uh, we actually led the region in how we developed share, care and shelter plans for the local community there. So we've done excellent work on each one of these things. However, what I uh, challenged our team with, and we received this on Thursday, so I want to acknowledge that. I said, I think we need a dashboard that tells us roughly where do we think we fit on every one of these categories today, and where could we be in very short order? So now we're going to share with you what the results of that are. So these are the six different categories, and they may be a little bit hard to read on the screen, but this presentation will be available afterwards um, for those of you who are having difficulty reading it. Um, and you can see, I'm just gonna kind of go through each one of these uh, briefly. The very first one, our indicator is in the red, and that one is around the stability of COVID-19. And the reason that it's in the red is that um, the governor's office has created a pass-fail test related to um, a number of cases. And the pass-fail test is no more than one case per 10,000. 
uh, in a 14-day period and no COVID-related deaths in a 14-day period. So this has been widely reported, but it is a pass-fail test. It is not something that has any discretion at the local level for how um, you can maneuver those or how you would consider uh, case transmission in your community. I am gonna ask Dr. Awashin Pine to discuss this at length today, so I'm not gonna say too much more about that. Uh, the other areas, protection of essential workers. These are guidance from employers and essential critical infrastructure workplaces, availabilities of supplies and well. We're looking good there. Testing capacity is looking very good in Stanislaus County. Um, we're very pleased with the amount of testing that's been brought up and we think we easily can meet that standard there. Um, our containment capacity, such as contact tracing, I wanna thank the board for your support. You were leading the effort to add contact tracers before the state of California started making this a priority. This board approved additional resources for the public health department. Um, we have a huge team of county individuals that are supporting this effort now, um, and uh, you have a lot to be proud of there and our public health team as well. Uh, hospital capacity, um, we definitely meet that criteria. We've reported those numbers routinely. You could look on our dashboard on any given day, and you can see the level of vacancies in our local hospitals, um, which is challenging them tremendously financially. And then the last one uh, that I wanna mention is um, uh, protection of vulnerable populations. Our challenge here is that um, uh, you need to maintain a 14-day supply of personal protective equipment in all of the skilled nursing facilities. So that may not be, it may be in the red today, but that's easily curable. We can cure that issue um, relatively quickly and working with those as well. And I do wanna refer back to the hospital capacity slide a little bit more. Um, uh, we're, we're actually, uh, we're, we'll be able to uh, greatly increase the hospital capacity uh, chart. The reason that it's in yellow is not based on available, uh, available beds. Um, the reason that it's in yellow is more based on the PPE supply for hospitals and the fact that we've been using some alternate uh, guidelines around the use of PPE and so forth. So there are some technical things there that need to, that need to be corrected. But I will share with you that I've personally uh, met, along with our entire team, um, each week of this uh, crisis with all of the hospital execs in our community, and they feel that they have all of the materials that they need every single week. We specifically ask about this topic and whether there's anything we can do more to support their efforts. It appears that the state's guideline has a very high bar for what they expect hospitals to be prepared to do in this fashion, but I will personally report to you that all of our local hospital executives um, are very satisfied with the supplies, materials that they have on hand, and that they feel that they're capable of, of managing uh, our, our spread in Stanislaus County. On the next chart, um, this is where we could be in a week. Um, and when I uh, put this together, it's, it's really a challenge to ourselves of what are the things that we can tune in here quickly. Um, and some of these guidelines are very good, to be honest with you. They're things that, you know, it's, a, it's an appropriate thing for us to challenge ourselves to be very, very well prepared before you uh, begin reopening additional portions of, of the economy and, and our community. Um, however, the thing that will stick out the most on this slide is that um, no matter what we do this week, we cannot change that upfront standard. It is what we refer to as a litmus test. It is a numerical calculation of what we have in terms of cases um, and deaths in our community. So it is a pass-fail test, essentially. Um, and in that case, uh, we fail this test. Um, and we will fail the test a, a week from now as well. Um, I'll share with you that many communities have tried to come up with unique ways to look at those rules and regulations. The state in the last 48 hours has already course corrected some of their interpretations to make it very, very clear that um, there is no workaround to that particular metric and threshold and that communities or, or counties that are trying to go um, look at this in a different way um, are learning that very, very quickly. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and um, I wanna talk a little bit more about that very first indicator uh, in depth. So like I said, this is a pass-fail test um, that says the prevalence of COVID-19 cases must be low enough to be swiftly contained from an epidemiological response. So no more than one case per 10,000 in the last 14 days prior to attestation submission date and no COVID-19 related death in the last 14 days prior to that date as well. Um, so uh, I'll share with you that um, uh, basically you would, you would look at this and uh, based on our number of population and so forth, uh, we would have no more than 56 cases in the last two weeks. Um, so we're not going to meet that standard. 
Uh, some counties have tried to interpret this a different way, um, and I don't know, think they're going to be very successful in doing that. But you know, nonetheless, there'll be some clarification from the state. But it appears that the interpretation is no more than 56 cases in the last two weeks. And then the, the second criteria there is very clear. No COVID-19 death in the last 14 days prior to the attest attestation submission date. Um, we've had approximately 10 in Stanislaus County. Um, and uh, any of our attempts to um, uh, reach out or to influence what this guideline is uh, do not appear to be um, getting any traction at the state level. So I want to summarize for you what is the current status of reopening Stanislaus County. Um, at this point, uh, state actions have not resulted uh, in an increased local control for most counties, including Stanislaus. There are some counties that will meet the criteria that the state has laid out. They are almost exclusively small, uh, very, very rural counties. Um, medium and large size counties are not going to qualify under this uh, rule. There may be some exceptions for a few unique medium sized counties. Certainly large counties are not going to qualify. The criteria essentially treats the smallest county in the state the same as the largest county in the state. And of course, we fall around the 16th, 17th mark in terms of counties, um, so we're much more on the larger medium size. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the state is uh, not coordinating with our public health or local public health officer on this. Um, and Dr. Wishing Pine can mention uh, what she'd like about that. But I think the public um, believes that somehow we're working behind the scenes on these issues and that we're trying to coordinate, especially when you listen to the press conferences that the state puts on around these issues. It appears that there's a lot of dialogue going on here between the local level and the state. Um, that is not accurate. Uh, there, there is no local connection, public discussion that's going on. And we're actually hard pressed to see where um, the state is actually connecting with local public health officers anywhere in the state that we're aware of. Um, the counties do not qualify for a variance or are expected to wait for the governor to determine when to move forward. Uh, we've watched the press conferences very closely, especially over the last few days to see now that this guidance is out, what is the governor saying about it? Um, but it's very, very clear um, that, um, uh, that, that counties such as Stanislaus and most counties of our size um, are being told that we will wait to do anything else in our economy until the state is ready for us to move forward. Uh, there's also a statement that uh, has been made repeatedly that over 70% of the economy is open. Um, that is absolutely does not appear to be the case in Stanislaus County. And we tried to really challenge ourselves with that comment and think through, you know, well, how could, you know, how could you really look at our total economy and the businesses that are open or not open? I think most people in this community um, just in your normal travels, and if you go to uh, any level of commerce in our community, you wouldn't agree with that comment. And we tried to really challenge ourselves, and I'll tell you, there is no one in our organization that can make a case to say that over 70% of the economy is open. And I've heard that, that comment repeatedly from state officials. Um, so they may be referring to some other portions of the economy that don't impact Stanislaus County, but there's no question that the current orders from the state of California and our lack of ability to influence those at the local level is damaging our economy, economy well beyond 30%. So um, the state continues to provide more detail on these guidelines and the control measures. Um, so um, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, we're gonna continue to get uh, information from the state. We have business guidelines that are released by the state without advance notice or local input. So like I shared with you last week, we saw guidance come out or we saw information related to um, uh, things like um, uh, pet grooming and other things. Those are things we've worked on locally. And then uh, they get included or we get restrictions placed on us that we have no idea are coming at the local level as well. Um, enforcement through state licensing agencies. I will share with you that state licensing agencies are out in force throughout the state of California. So those organizations that, um, that are um, uh, trying to open in a fashion that is not consistent with the, the current state law, um, they will be uh, followed up on uh, by a local state agency or a state agency of some sort. We've seen it repeatedly in those counties that have moved forward with some kind of action from the Board of Supervisors that is contrary to the state's um, uh, orders. 
Um, there have been written threats to counties who exceed the state order, so that's very, very clear. Uh, I think those have been widely reported uh, in the media. I think I'm tracking four different counties now that have fallen into that category, um, receiving uh, documentation from uh, Cal OES, I believe. Um, and there are additional protections for presumptions of workers' compensation as well. It's a very, very important issue that the governor uh, issued uh, guidelines last week that are very, very favorable uh, to employees who work in any fashion in our economy right now as it relates to the contraction of, of uh, COVID-19 and the financial impact to those organizations uh, should they provide services and then have someone, it's presumed that the person received it uh, from work uh, largely. And obviously then that shifts the cost burden for all of that care and so forth uh, back to the employer and has a significant impact. So I do have a few more things to share, but um, I'm gonna ask Dr. V to go through some of the same slides that she did last week, but to refresh those and then to also provide some new perspective based on all of the events over this last week. So Dr. Wei Pine, it's yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so these are the updated slides. They're um, quite a bit the same that you saw last week, um, just updated with another week's data. So as we look at this one, which is cases by date of symptom onset, we discussed this a little um, last week about why we don't in general use cases to look at um, activity of um, a virus or an infectious disease in the community. Um, this can be affected by so many different parameters. Um, people without access to health care will be less likely to test. Um, test availability impacts it. Uh, there, there are so many things that actually impact testing and um, numbers that we, in general, like in influenza season and others, this is not what we look at uh, for our surveillance numbers. Um, so we usually look at other measures that are more stable and can be more trustworthy and don't depend on someone going to the doctor, don't depend on someone getting a test done, that test being ordered. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, as we look at this one, this is the date of symptom onset if we remove um, the uh, cases from our congregate living facility. Oh, I'm sorry, this is hospitalized by date of symptom onset. I took that slide out. So hospitalized by date of symptom onset, this includes our skilled nursing facility um, um, patients that uh, have tested positive. And if we go to the next one, um, this is the one that excludes our skilled nursing facility with hospitalized. So one of the reasons first that we use hospitalized data is that that tends to be a consistent measure. Um, the number of people hospitalized, uh, the amount of severe disease tends to be a steady proportion of people who become ill. Uh, and so when we look at this, we're able to more see a stable trend that doesn't depend on someone saying, well, maybe I'll feel better tomorrow and not going to the doctor to get tested. Uh, by the time they're sick enough to need hospital, I mean, they in general go to the hospital. Um, I look at it with excluding the skilled nursing facility because the decisions that we're trying to make involve mixing in the community, going to businesses. What is our community transmission and our risk out in the community? Uh, this does not include um, risk of a transmission inside a congregate living facility. And I don't ever want to say that that's not important. It's extremely important. But as we're looking to make decisions about um, businesses and increasing the mixing of our people out in the public and going into businesses and um, just more, more activity and more mixing, um, that does not affected by what's going on inside a congregate living setting. So as we look at this, you can see we peaked again. It was towards late uh, March, March 27, 26, somewhere around there. And we've pretty much been decreasing since. Uh, we've had a couple more hospitalizations recently, but I would still call this a decreasing or stable trend in our hospitalizations for about the past month. Um, we can go on. Uh, another measure that we look, like to look at is our influenza-like illness. And these are all measures that are looked at through um, many of the different uh, guidance documents that come out from many different agent, uh, agencies to how, how we monitor and track illness uh, from resolve to save lives. They've got a lot of different um, COVID guidance out and uh, influenza-like illness is a classic uh, syndromic surveillance monitor. So again, these are all the people who come to our emergency departments and our five hospitals in the county. Um, when they come in, it's their chief complaint data from when they come in and say, you know, they ask why you're here and they say, um, I have fever and a cough. 
So fever and a cough is influenza-like illness, so they get put into this category, and we're able to document that. So again, you can see that we've been declining. Um, February was still flu season. Uh, I don't know what happened that day. A lot of people went in. Maybe maybe that was also fear. One of the problems that this is is that you can impact it by media and, and knowledge and people wanting to go in and get tested. But as we look recently since, you know, 21st of March or so, you can see definitely decreasing and staying stable for our influenza-like illness visits to our emergency departments. And that's borne out in our hospitalization data. So here's, um, you just saw this on the website. I took a screenshot yesterday and put this in. Um, you know, we, we hit a high in the last two weeks of 36, all of 36 COVID-19 uh, uh, hospitalizations. And to recall, we have over 1,200 licensed beds in this uh, county. Um, to a couple days ago, we were at 21. So we have plenty of capacity uh, in our hospitals at this current time. And so I want to talk a little bit about clusters. I did not present this data last week. Um, we have had three larger clusters of um, uh, gatherings, uh, facility, congregate living facilities, uh, work sites with um, many cases linked. Um, so as of yesterday, and what's on our website right now, 508 cases and 21 deaths. Um, the skilled nursing facility, we have 129 Stanislaus County residents um, and 14 deaths. Um, that is a 25% of our total um, cases came from um, this skilled nursing facility. I do want to remind people that um, county jurisdiction is only for county residents. There are people in the facility who are not county residents. This does not... Um, it, their, they, their permanent address is not the skilled nursing facility, so they are allocated out by their permanent address. Um, skilled nursing facilities are not are not permanent living centers, so um, that is not their permanent address, and people get very confused by that fact. Um, the grocery distribution center, I think we had heard about, um, you know, about a month ago, uh, Stanislaus County, even though that distribution center was not in this county, we had 56 Stanislaus County residents that worked in that facility and became infected, and there was one death with that. And then the family funeral I spoke of last week that was um, at 14 cases is now at 26, um, now accounting for 5% of all of our cases, and there have been, thank goodness, no deaths from that. So um, from these three large clusters, you can see we've had 211 or 42% of all of our cases have just come from these three large clusters um, and 71% of our deaths. I wanted to really talk about this because as we look at our data from our contact investigations, what we really see is where our risk is. There's a couple other small worksite um, outbreaks of six and four um, transmission events, I guess I should call them. It, but what we really see is congregate living, uh, of course, because it's a lot of people living in close proximity. Households are where we see transmission big. Um, work sites where they're not able to keep social distance for their shift, and um, they spend a lot of time. People spend a lot of time at work, um, at least eight hours a day. So um, they're high-risk settings if you're not able to keep um, your distance uh, six feet at all time. And I'm told with... Um, grocery, uh, warehousing, and distribution centers, it's not always possible. Um, and those are considered essential services. And, and I think there's a lot of work going on trying to protect the workers in those facilities as well. And then, of course, um, mass gatherings. Um, gatherings together in people's homes um, for prolonged period of times, especially for emotional events, uh, tend to be high transmission events as well. And um, that's been written up in numerous places. There's been numerous funerals written up already and, and other gatherings. So I want to really emphasize the point that home transmission, work site transmission where you're not keeping your six foot distance and in your home, and gatherings where you're not keeping your, your uh, six foot uh, distance at all times. Those are really the risk factors that we see for transmission. Um, I do have to say in this county, with the numbers where we are, I don't have a lot of concern about some increase in our mixing. I don't want people to go and, you know, sit together in groups at a coffee house for two hours and, and, and chat. That's, that's going to be an event that could um, lead to transmission. But as we look at um, going inside a store and trying on clothes, I, I can't see how that would, would really increase our risk very much. We're certainly not going to see high transmission um, effects from that. So this is, um, I think that's my last slide for now. 
Oh, I do have one. Yeah, the potential harm. So closing businesses and um, having people not be able to work, not be able to afford their food. Um, I, we can look at um, increased food bank need, which is certainly up. But one of the things that we've been talking about a bit is suicide hotline calls. And this is this is also good news. It's great that people are reaching out. Um, there's been, as you can see, a pretty good increase from 2019 to 2020. So in 2019, the, there was an average of 11 calls per week in the first half of the year. Um, in from the height of this, I would say so far today, uh, February 15 through April 25, that's averaged 46 calls. Some reason for that is that other ways that people access help aren't necessarily available. Um, group therapies, um, hospitals, schools where people can get help aren't available right now. Uh, I'm glad people are using this hotline. That's great news and, and um, people should call it if they feel the need. Um, but it's also a bit of a concern that we are seeing this need. And there was a, a reasons gathered were stress from COVID-19, stress from not having my job, fear of COVID-19. Um, so it, it is causing stress in our community. Uh, ability not to work and provide for your family is causing stress in the community. Um, we have to look at both sides. Uh, poverty impacts health in, in huge and very detrimental ways. And um, I, I, it's just, it, you have to take into account both sides of the equation when we're looking at activities, because there's always benefit from doing things and harm from doing things. And that's that's part of what I'm trying to bring forward with this one slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weishan Payan. I have a couple of slides left uh, here, and, I, and we have some positive things we want to share with the community <laughs> as well, if we can. And I know this uh, presentation has, has sounded a little critical as well, more so than normal. Um, but um, in working with the public health officer over the last week, navigating all of these events that we've shared with you today, looking at all of the data that has been shared, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this board has done an excellent job of looking to the guidance of our public health officer and saying what is best for the people of Stanislaus County based on, you know, all of those credentials. Um, I always like to read those credentials out, but we have one of the best public health officers in the state of California, if anywhere. We're proud of that. And uh, it's become increasingly clear, if not just crystal clear, um, that uh, myself and the public health officer have reached the same conclusion over the last week, uh, that it, we no longer believe that any local stay-at-home orders are necessary. That um, essentially the state of California has made it very clear that um, their stay-at-home orders and uh, their local, or that their orders will prevail over local orders and that we do not have an opportunity to reopen portions of this economy that have not been approved by the governor of California. Um, we've worked with our legal team and we've worked with county council to look at different ways. We've looked at how other counties have, have tackled this issue. Um, other counties have obviously you know, uh, discussed uh, litigation, discussed other opportunities and so forth, but we have seen multiple examples where the governor has exerted authority at the local level um, to maintain um, uh, control. And so we acknowledge that. Um, and in doing so, uh, we feel that um, it uh, would not be appropriate to continue local um, orders that uh, are either in conflict with the state order um, uh, or do not recognize or would be more restrictive than the state order unless they're very, very much needed in our local community. So there are a few things that Dr. Ration Pine uh, will maintain in local orders. Um, but by, I believe, the end of today or by tomorrow, uh, we will be lifting much of our local orders and acknowledging that the state orders uh, are in effect uh, here in Stanislaus County mm -hmm. as well as the entire state unless you've been granted a variance. Um, and uh, the variance is that criteria that we went through earlier that we do not qualify um, clearly. Um, at this point, um, you know, uh, our perspective on this is that the governor's comments regarding providing control at the local level um, are largely rhetoric and not fact at this point. Um, most communities, the vast majority of the population of California, including the population of Stanislaus County, will remain under the direction of the governor's orders and not under the direction of local boards of supervisors guided by local public health officials. That is a fact for our community, and we just wanna be very blunt in saying that. Um, we have lots of public comment here today. I've been reading through the public comment that's been pouring in, 
and um, the public wants this board to take some actions to reopen portions of the economy, large portions, smaller portions. There are lots of arguments on either side of this. Um, and there are lots of people in our community that feel safer operating under the guidance of the governor as well. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, however, the vast majority of feedback we have received um, have been requests to reopen portions of the economy for a variety of reasons, especially given the data and the science that's been presented by our local public health officer and what's happening in Stanislaus County. Um, so I, this presentation very much is about ensuring that our community is aware of the situation that we find ourselves in and that um, uh, per the structure and the latest public health order from the state of California, this Board of Supervisors cannot open the local economy any more than they already have and that the public health officer will be taking action to ensure that any local orders are only necessary um, uh, for uh, the, the preservation of isolation, quarantine orders, and so forth for us to um, uh, administratively and enforcement-wise conduct activities related to the office of the public health officer as well as some key provisions that um, she has put in place um, for, the, for the protection of, of uh, food supply, manufacturing, and so forth. So you'll see a couple of those things. But in terms of what businesses are open in Stanislaus County, um, that will be up to the state of California and the governor of California until he makes such order that provides us control to do it. And at this time, uh, we have um, no expectation of when that may occur. I do want to acknowledge that um, our uh, Good to Go Stanislaus program is ready. It's actually good to go, which is uh, the exact name. And I have uh, a copy of it here. I think all of our board members do. Um, our team has worked tremendously with our local business community to put together a plan for us to reopen the economy of Stanislaus County. Um, I'm very proud of the entire community that's come together to do this. Um, they did excellent work. Um, so we have the plan. This is on our website, it was posted just this morning. I checked it about a half hour ago and it's there. So we want to send the message that we do have plans. We do have items. We have work we're ready to move forward with. Um, this will change over time. This is a living, breathing document. So I always encourage the public, please go to the website for the latest version of this because this will tweak over time. Um, but it is likely that a week from now, we're going to learn that some portion of our plans at the local level may be in conflict with what's happening at the state level. Um, today, we're expecting the governor to release additional plans uh, related to industry guidelines. So we've done a lot of this work. We're very, very proud of it. And we just have to acknowledge the environment we're working in. Uh, it could change on any given day, depending upon what we learn um, from Sacramento and any other state officials. So um, that is ready for us. Uh, we do need to formally share our position with the state. Um, you've clearly heard some editorial comments from us today in relation to where we're at with this. I've spoken with uh, most of the board members individually, and I've heard a lot of feedback from you in terms of uh, your thoughts on what's transpired over this last week. So um, uh, I want to acknowledge that we need to formally share that position. There is a specific recommendation I'm going to read in just a moment regarding that. And I do want to end um, on a little bit of positivity here um, in terms of what we think we can control at this point subject to any changes we learn from the state of California. A couple of things. First is uh, the planned reopening of public buildings. We're going to work with the city of Modesto um, to reopen 10th Street Place in the near future. Right now, we're scheduled to reopen on May 18th. I don't know that we're going to hit that date because there are a few things that we want to make sure we do. But particularly, we've been told that the governor's office is going to release guidelines today on reopening some businesses. So we want to see what those guidelines are and see if we could put them in place in short order. But we've been doing these plans and we've been targeting May 18th as the date that we would like to reopen this particular building, 10th Street Place, which is the center of our uh, government operations in Stanislaus County and uh, in tandem with the city of Modesto. Um, so we'll get more information out to the public on when we will be opening public lobbies for services. I do want to acknowledge that we have done a tremendous job of serving our public remotely and we've learned new ways to do business. We're never going to go back to business as we used to do it. So it's going to be different in some respects, but for those people who need to walk into the building and to discuss their matters and work with us, we're going to make that a little bit easier as quickly as we can. And then the next thing I want to announce is our uh, some of our regional park <coughs> openings. So you heard in public comment earlier, these are really important issues uh, for many members of our community. So the first, I think I mentioned this earlier, but I'll repeat, 
Uh, Modesto Reservoir is opening on May, 6th, uh, May 16th, uh, which is this Saturday, and Woodward uh, Reservoir opening June 6th um, uh, for watercraft um, uh, out on the lake. So that's the first phase of opening, boating and watercraft. However, um, we're also uh, currently working on plans for general admission opening of those lakes as well. You can expect that we'll have you know, much like you do at large grocery stores, we'll have metering at the door. So, you know, only so many people are going to be able to come in uh, on each given day. But these, um, these are really valuable assets to our community. And now more than ever, and you hear it in the public comment, people really appreciate um, the opportunity to recreate outside, get some fresh air and so forth. The latest data and science we've reviewed with the public health officer indicates that you're much safer out, outdoors in a sunny environment than you may be in an enclosed store and so forth. So, um, we're going to try to make sure that happens as quickly as possible. I also want to mention camping. We have reservations uh, at both of our reservoirs, Modesto and Woodward Reservoirs, for camping uh, throughout the month of June. So we're working with the Parks Department. We're going to need to work with County Council to figure out what we can do around some of those camping reservations. I will tell you that our intent is to prioritize our local community to ensure that they get to enjoy that. You heard public comment earlier about what was occurring up at Don Pedro, who was open to all communities and how they were flooded with folks who were wanting to recreate, which is a good, good thing. But unfortunately, we won't be able to open up our reservoirs for everyone in Northern California to come to this one location. So we need to work around that. And we'll get that information out hopefully very, very soon. I also want to acknowledge that the LaGrange Off-Road, uh, Off-Highway Vehicle Park uh, will be also be opening on June 6th. Um, the Frank Rains Park will not be opening this year. It usually closes um, by CAL FIRE um, on June 6th of each year, or uh, it, it would have usually closed by the beginning of June due to fire restrictions and so forth. So we've determined we're not going to reopen Frank Rains Park this, this year. However, the LaGrange Off-Highway Vehicle Park will be reopening, um, uh, I believe, on June 6th is what we're targeting there. So I appreciate the Parks Department as long as with the Sheriff's Department for doing everything that they can um, to try to build the staffing resources necessary and to get people back outside with some sense of normalcy in a safe way in our community. With that, we're gonna go forward, uh, we're gonna uh, review our recommendations. So the first is just to receive this update from the Chief Executive Officer, and I also wanna acknowledge Dr. Weishan Payan and all of her work in preparing today's uh, information. Uh, we wanna consider options and alternatives to be taken in response to the May 7th, 2020 guidance issued from the California Department of Public Health. And we want you to authorize uh, myself in conjunction with the Chairwoman of the Board of Supervisors to submit a response to the California Department of Public Health uh, we've seen other counties and some of the work that they've done to author some very good messaging to the state around um, uh, how, we're, um, how we're maneuvering through the state guidance at the local level and things that we need to see change in order for us to best serve uh, the residents of Stanislaus County, but particularly the emphasis on data and science at the local level. And we want to send that message very clearly um, to Sacramento um, with your support here today. So um, I know uh, you have a lot of feedback. We may have a lot of folks online who want to ask questions and, and speak as well today. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, reserve that. And I want to acknowledge County Council Bose is here with us as well. We have, may have some questions that are require some legal input. So thank you. Thank you, CEO and Dr. Rachel Payam, for your very thorough presentation and that it was data driven and very factual. We appreciate that. Questions or comments from the board? Uh, Supervisor uh, Chiesa. Dr. V. Yes. So we, every day we get our report from the National Association of Counties, from the California State Association of Counties, CSAC. We have our local information. I've, so you're one of the most important people in this room. How is information traveling? in a collaborative way, because the governor keeps talking about collaboration, to the Public Health Officers <coughs> Association. And I think you're on the executive committee, so you would, you would be at the top of the, uh, the information chain anyways. So how is it you guys are collaborating together on, on making the six points that are available to us? So, um, yeah, uh, there isn't a systematic way. Uh, well, there, there are a couple ways. So occasionally, um, usually with only a couple hours notice, we do get a meeting called, um, usually at five or six at night, um, where um, 
they request input. So what they did set up at the beginning was um, with the six indicators or whatever they call them, um, they asked for local health representatives to those. So five of those um, have had local health representatives on them. Uh, one of them, the last I heard, the local health representative had not yet been to a meeting and that was the business reopening um, um, subgroup. So um, that would be the systematic way of input. So I know on testing and contact inf uh, investigation and those um, uh, therapeutics and things like that, those five of the six have had uh, local health department input but past that, I don't know of any systematic way where input has gotten. It certainly hasn't uh, come from me in any systematic way. So are they utilizing, do you know if they're utilizing educational institutions to come up with the, the six priority or, or how are you going to score it? Because to me it seems like the 58 public health officers, assuming there's one for every county, but the 50 some, you would think that you guys collectively, you guys and gals would collectively would be setting what those markers are? No, no. Um, we find out about them usually at the press conference or maybe five minutes before. So, no. And there's 61 local health departments because there's three cities, okay. but there's one shared public health officer, so there's 60. Supervisor Withrow. Just real quick, just a quick question, and I got plenty of other stuff I'd like to talk about, but um, just with regard to um, county um, funds, and this is either for Jody or, or for the sheriff. I don't know if, if Jeff's still around here. Um, are, are we expending any county funds right now for enforcement? Are any of our dollars, our county dollars, being used for enforcement in this county right now? Is Jeff here? Yeah. Okay. So while uh, Sheriff Dirksy's on his way up, I'm going to at least answer that question. Enforcement to this point has been a multi pronged approach. Um, we've tried to do enforcement through education. Um, the governor, we're following the governor's lead on this, that it's, you know, let's try to educate the community. Um, we do have a code enforcement unit, um, so there's been some conversations with restaurants and so forth around what these parameters are. Um, at this point, there's very little resource in terms of county resources that are being utilized for enforcement, acknowledging that the governor has not, um, uh, has not really wanted local resources to be spent on enforcement. However, I will acknowledge in the last day, just in his last most recent press conference, I've heard more hints and acknowledgement that local enforcement is somehow expected, um, but I'm just probably reading into his words as well. But uh, the enforcement issue primarily is with law enforcement, um, and I'll let the sheriff speak to that. Thanks, Jody. Thanks for having me up here. Uh, the, simpl the simplest answer from the sheriff's office standpoint is no. We haven't done any enforcement around this. Uh, I've said from day one, March 19th, that I won't arrest anyone uh, for violating this order, and I stand by that. Um, and to be clear, citing people is also an arrest. It's a non-custodial arrest, but it is still an arrest. So the violation of this order is a misdemeanor, so the only action that we can take would be some sort of an arrest to include a citation, and that would be the penalty uh, for that. Now, with that, let's, let's be clear that you know, the only thing that I've heard out of the governor's mouth kind of officially on record is that he does not want this to be a law enforcement function. He wanted social pressure. And uh, we have spent some time reaching out to uh, businesses specifically early on, uh, mostly focused around bars and gyms. Those seem to be the, the biggest problems. And I'll tell you, I personally spoke with a few of them, and they were very receptive to the phone calls. They all agreed after the fact, uh, after we spoke, and they did the right thing, and they closed down. But there was no enforcement that was taken. It was just a few phone calls. The, you know, and part of my position is also formed by the fact that the JCC, the Judicial Council of California, they put this zero bail into effect. And as of this morning, we've released 509 criminals on zero bail. Now, about 150 of those were in custody at the time that that went into effect, and then the other roughly 350 have been subsequently released for new uh, law violations that meet the criteria for this zero bail. Of those 9 percent, <coughs> excuse me, 47 or 9 percent have been rearrested. That's individuals. There, are, but there have been 57 rearrests of those folks. The record is uh, one guy holds is five. He's been rearrested five times since I think it was April 13th that that went into effect. 
So, uh, and then we've had we've had a three and a couple of twos. So we have a few frequent flyers there. Uh, but again, these are our folks that are out there committing crimes in our community and and making our community less safe. Uh, to that effect, though, we've also seen some crimes go up, specifically assault, kind of general assaults are up 25%, and family crimes are up 10%. And so family crimes is sort of, that would include domestic violence, but it also includes some family crimes that do not uh, meet the criteria for domestic violence, maybe a father against a son, something like that. Uh, so those are up 10%. Uh, we, we do believe that child uh, crimes, child molestation, and so on, child abuse are up, but um, uh, many of those crimes are reported through schools. When a kid goes to school, they, they report that to a teacher or someone else that brings it to our attention. And obviously with children not in school right now, uh, the reporting of those type of crimes has dropped. Uh, you know, and part of this not arresting people for violating this order is that law enforcement as a profession, but specifically here in, in Stanislaus County across both my agency and all the others, we have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort in the last several years to develop a good relationship with our community. And quite frankly, I don't think that the right thing to do is go out there and arrest people that aren't standing, you know, they're standing too close together or whatever the case may be. Uh, so the fact that we're not going to arrest someone, uh, I've made that very clear. I also want to make it very clear that uh, we are treating people like adults and the expectation is that they reciprocate and act like adults. The guidance and the guidelines are out there. Do not have mass, guide, uh, mass parties, don't have uh, mass meetings, max, max, uh, large groupings, whatever, in whatever venue that takes place, don't do it. And so just do the right thing. And that's what's happened across our county. And I think, I think that the, the numbers that Dr. V just reported outside a couple of those congregate living facilities or a couple of work environments, we have seen that our community has stepped up and done the right thing without any enforcement. So I'm gonna say, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and I can, I can speak on a personal note. I have a college graduate. She graduates from Fresno State on Friday and she was looking forward to a celebration. And over the last six weeks, that has dwindled down to now it will be my family, uh, that same family that lives together every, every other day of the week. We will be celebrating that. So I understand that there are a lot of uh, desires, a lot of graduation events coming up, and people want to congregate. All I can say is don't do it. And pending any of your questions, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Sheriff. Other questions from the board for the sheriff? And the sheriff, you mentioned this one guy has been arrested five times. I mean, how many times do you have to arrest him for? You just put him in jail and keep him there. Well, is, un uh, unfortunately, the, the JCC's decision doesn't allow us to just do that. If every arrest still qualifies for zero bail, then we have to release him. Now, we have uh, on some of the more, this, that particular guy has been arrested every single time on trespassing by MPD. Uh, so I don't, I don't know the circumstances of it. Uh, but on many crimes, we have also gone to get what's called the bail enhancement. So for any case, uh, you can get a bail enhancement. So if someone steals a car and bail was $10,000, we could go before a judge and request an enhanced bail of 25 or 50 or 350 or whatever the number is. We can do the same thing for zero bail. Uh, so the DA's office has been great. They have really stepped up and helped us with that. They've done it. We've had our staff do it. So we have done that on a number of occasions, but uh, some of the crimes simply, they're not really going to get it for that. Yeah, I was curious what criteria that you had for that, too, because I, I don't uh, <clears throat> have any good feelings about this zero bail. And there's got to be some consequences for crime. <clears throat> if you don't have it, you just go out and reoffend if they don't think anything's going to happen to them. Um, I agree. I, I think we're in Very agreement so. on that. So, Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you for everything you've done, too. You've really been a great sheriff. Thank you. Supervisor Berryhill, do you have any questions of Dr. V, the sheriff, or CEO Hayes, or comments? This is just going at, literally, in my opinion, the sheriff is doing The cure is worse. The cure is worse. Thank you, Supervisor. I don't know if we're going to do our comments right now. Can we talk? Or do I you guys have several wait? questions. Do you, you have no, additional you can, questions? No, why don't you finish with your questions okay. and then we'll. Okay. 
I wanted to ask several questions before I'm sure all of us will have some comments to make as well. And some of these questions have already been answered, but I thought it would be helpful to just repeat them in a very concise way. I think some are for Dr. V, several are for Dr. V, and then a couple of them for CEO Hayes. Uh, Dr. V, is, as we've seen from the state guidance and the six metrics that we have to be able to report on and meet, one of those, as was discussed, is that we have to have had zero deaths in our community over the last 14 days. In your opinion, is that a meaningful metric when it comes to protecting public health and when it comes to making decisions about whether we could safely reopen some aspects of our economy? So that's a difficult question, honestly. Um, it is. I don't think death um, is necessarily a measure that wouldn't be used. Uh, we often track death as the marker of severe disease. And so I'm, I think that's probably an appropriate one. The problem is zero, um, no matter how big your county is. Um, and that's really not reasonable, in my opinion. Um, I mean, that's holding a Los Angeles to the same standard as Alpine County. So it. it it's something you can meet in a smaller county that just is not possible to meet in a larger county. So um, when I saw that, I looked back, and from our first death, the longest we've gone without a death is eight days. So even when we weren't having very many cases, um, you, you, you would still see deaths more than one in every 14 days. And so um, it, it, it's, it's, it makes more sense to do it per, per population, to standardize between a very small county and a very large county. Um, so I'm not quite sure why there wasn't that standardization taken. Thank you. And then the second metric that is problematic for most counties mm -hmm. is that uh, we would only have one positive case per 10,000 people at the same time when we are significantly ramping up testing. Yeah. Is that logical to you? And is that an appropriate metric for yeah. making reopening decisions? So uh, to me, it's not because I think you could work to get around it, which wouldn't be the appropriate thing to do. You could, you know, go out and test all low-risk people and, and decrease your likelihood of getting a positive. I mean, it, it a little bit punishes you for doing the good testing that you need to do to control this disease. So when I'm looking at household contacts, you have a symptomatic household contact, we could not test and just say, oh yeah, we're sure it's it, stay home for 10 days. Um, but we still would like to test and um, diagnose and ensure. Um, it's not the only respiratory virus around, but it's highly likely if you're living in the same household with someone who is a confirmed case that you would have um, a positive test if you're symptomatic. Um, so it, it, to me, it a little bit, if you're doing good contact investigations and really trying to find and going into the work sites and going into the homes and, and really detecting disease, um, it, it, it a little bit punishes you if you want to use that word. It's not uh, conducive to doing good investigations using that as a measure, is, is my opinion. And so strict, I mean, we couldn't even have four, four cases a day. That's, that's pretty low for a county our size, I would say, over 14 days. That's, that's not a lot of cases, so. Thank yeah. you. And then my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that most other states are relying on the metrics developed by John Hopkins University in order to guide their reopening decisions and whether various communities in their state are ready to reopen. Is that true? And do the John Hopkins provided guidelines use either of those two metrics as a meaningful measure for whether it's safe to begin reopening? I haven't looked at those for a while, so sorry, I don't, I don't have that answer. I, I like the John Hopkins guidance for the, they risk assess the businesses. And I think that's really neat to look at when you're trying to look at how to open your businesses. They've got some nice risk assessments. What, because um, we were writing a plan, and what I had put in our plan was um, the resolve to save lives, which is Tom Frieden is there, the former director of the CDC. And um, they have a whole, they have three columns, and you go through and you look at the measures in those columns. And those measures align with what I've shown, influenza-like illness and your syndromic surveillance, and looking at hospitalizations, and looking at measures like that that, that aren't just pure case counts. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then I believe you covered this in your presentation, but in, in your opinion, um, guided by your public health expertise, does it make sense to use our outbreak numbers, for example, mm -hmm. the skilled nursing facilities, et cetera, uh, in our total numbers when it comes to making decisions about whether we could safely and slowly reopen some aspects of our economy? Yeah, so I, I would not. Uh, that's transmission in a facility, which to me isn't the same as transmission um, in the public, which is what we're talking about doing. Um, some of the arguments has been that, okay, well, the staff are mixing in the public. Well, okay, then I guess we can count the staff if, if we want to. I still think the transmission event was in the facility, but um, the residents aren't out and mixing while they're infectious, so that doesn't make sense to me. Um, to add the residents, I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to count them as transmission events because that's really what you're looking at with the with the numbers. You're looking at what's your transmission in the community, but that's not reflective of transmission in the community when you include, um, a, a, you know, a, a facility, a congregate living facility. Great, thank you. Many people have suggested to us, and I, I think many of us may agree, that there are aspects of the state order that are arbitrary at best, if not contradictory and illogical. Um, some of those have to do which, with which phase different businesses or activities are put into. And so, for example, in your opinion, based on your public health expertise, would you suggest reopening Vintage Fair Mall before you would suggest reopening playgrounds and parks or county libraries? Yeah, so if you look at and the, the mall is in stage two for the governor and then the parks and the, uh, the playgrounds, the um, libraries are in stage three, which uh, if you look at the Johns Hopkins, um, both of those are considered very low risk. Um, actually, I would say by their, um, they do it based on three different measures, but uh, libraries are, by their measures, safer than malls. Um, I, I'm a big advocate of libraries for so many reasons, because everybody should have a library to go to get books um, and read. But um, there also are cooling centers. As we enter the summer, um, if we have some hot days, which I can't imagine we won't, it's we, we get hot days here, uh, we need to have libraries open as, as places for people to go and cool down. So I would move them up, libraries certainly um, up. I don't think malls are terribly high risk either, um, because People, people do congregate there. And I think as long as, like the sheriff said, people have to be adults. They have to understand you can't congregate, um, sit around within six feet of each other for hours and, and chat. That's, that's going to lead to transmission events. Um, then the playgrounds, to me, um, again, if you're thinking that the virus is going to be on the surface of playground equipment, that isn't really what science says, because outside in the heat, um, if it's not the direct sunlight, it's still the heat, virus is not gonna live very long on an outdoor surface. So I think the concern about playgrounds is more in mixing, and again, we need to, parents to make sure that the kids aren't mixing outside of households or in very small groups like a consistent daycare group when playing on these, um, these playground equipment because kids need to get out and play, and I think parents need to be able to supervise their kids and make sure that they stay safe while they're playing. Thank you. And then finally, in summary, based on all of that, based on our local data and metrics that you have provided for us in charts and elsewhere, and on your public health expertise, it is, is it your opinion that we could continue to safely and slowly reopen some aspects of our local economy, businesses and activities? Yeah. Even if we look at the governor's stage two, I think we don't qualify for the variants, but I have no concern about opening up... Um, uh, the, the the businesses that are um, listed in the the later in stage two. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on my tongue here, but I I don't have concern about that. I I think they're very low risk businesses, and I think there's low likelihood of transmission as long as people do a couple things. They remember not to congregate and gather outside their household unit. Um, they stay six feet apart at all times. Wash your hands. Don't go out if you're sick. And face coverings are, are I think there's more data coming that those face coverings are going to stop transmission maybe by about 50%. So wear a face covering when you're out in public. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. And then CEO, CEO Hayes, you alluded to the fact earlier that 
the uh, state is perhaps coming out with enforcement mechanisms against either businesses or counties who are not in compliance with the state order. What are some of those potential enforcement mechanisms or threats that counties or businesses may need to be concerned about? Okay, thank you very much for asking that. I, I had meant to emphasize this a little bit earlier. There are actual, uh, there are multiple avenues in which the state uh, will enforce these guidelines. Um, uh, one is uh, through the direct uh, licensure that they have of state licensing boards. Uh, so we have seen in other communities that um, uh, where certain businesses are open that are perceived to be in violation of the order, uh, local businesses are receiving uh, direct communication, if not personal visits um, from state authorities who will uh, uh, threaten to revoke or fine those individuals. Uh, those are outside of local control and they're very real. Um, so I would um, strongly encourage any local business that uh, they need to inform themselves and educate themselves on what the state guidelines are, uh, covid19.ca.gov, and we walked through the process of where to go find things. You really do need to pay attention. Uh, the state will enforce these matters at the local level. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge that several counties have been sent letters uh, from the state of California um, threatening um, funding and essentially um, potentially transferring additional liabilities to local communities that exceed the governor's order. Um, these are very real legal considerations um, and they're very real funding considerations. Um, we were fortunate that we received some funding through the CARES Act directly uh, sent to Stanislaus County and we'll have more information in the next couple of weeks about how we might be able to push those funds out into our community and to support that effort. However, many counties in California did not receive that level of funding and they have been basically put on direct notice from the state of California um, that they um, uh, put their funding in jeopardy um, if they proceed in any fashion contrary to the governor's orders. Um, I do want to acknowledge in the news conferences and press conferences that I've watched, these discussions are, are talked about almost casually as if there's almost casual conversation and, and, and cooperative mutual conversation going on between locals and the state of California. I have been on the phone with county executives throughout the entire state. I've been on the phone with supervisors, uh, boards of supervisors uh, members in uh, the Central Valley as well as the entire state of California. That is not what is reported by everyone that I speak to. So we would love that kind of cooperative spirit to work around some of these technical issues. It is not happening. It's very clear um, that the um, legal uh, order is within the control of the state of California and that they will use all of their enforcement mechanisms to ensure that local communities stay within those guidelines. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the board? You know, I'm just gonna kind of go off on the comment here if I can. Jim, is that okay or are you gonna? No, I just had one question. Go I'm gonna save my comments for later. So. Uh, I just uh, was curious from Dr. V, the, um, you mentioned that the sunlight you know, would kill the virus a lot sooner than inside. Uh, <clears throat> I've heard that many times and I believe that, I'm sure that's true. A uh, question uh, though I did had uh, since you brought up the children is that um, I've seen news reports that uh, children uh, don't seem to be uh, quite able to, to get this uh, coronavirus, that it don't, doesn't seem to be transmitted to them easily or that adults can get it off of them. I just wondered if you had an opinion about uh, younger children that, uh, I'd heard they had some type of protein in their lungs or something that prevented them from getting the infection. Uh, I was wondering if you had a comment. Yeah, so the role of children in the spread of COVID-19 is still under study. Um, initially from China, it was thought, they were thought not to have a large role. I think, which doesn't really make sense because flu, they're, you know, they're a big spreader. Um, so children tend not to get ill. So we know with this disease, the older you are, the more severe your symptoms. Every year older, your symptoms are more severe and you're more likely to suffer uh, severe disease. So kids in general have done very well. Um, they don't yet know if kids um, will pass to adults like adults pass uh, the virus to adults. Um, I think more data are emerging that it's probably true that they are going to be just as involved in the transmission cycle as they are with flu or any other disease. So uh, it's nice that they don't get very ill, but I think 
we're going to find out that they probably do transmit the inf infection to adults. Um, there's also the new um, syndrome that they're defining in children, um, pediatric multisystem something. It's a Kawasaki-like disease, so it's a, like an inflammation of the blood vessels. Um, and they just described 73 cases out of New York City. So clearly children can get ill and severely ill with this disease. Um, there have been pediatric deaths. They're very rare, but um, they're, it, it's still not well defined. Um, again, I think they defined this virus on January 7. So it's we only have a few months of knowledge about this virus, and we will learn more. But um, I, I would be hesitant to say that they are less infectious or less likely to spread than adults. Okay, thank you, Doug. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no further questions from the board,